Hello everyone, Rohan this side and once again I welcome you all to this new video in the series of YouTube academic projects that has been started by Spartificial. The unique thing about this project series, if you are not aware about it already, is that in each video we will introduce you with some cool project, teach you certain concepts in it and then leave some tasks for you to solve at the end of every video. Now if you are going to complete this kind of task, then based on how you are solving it, you will be getting this opportunity to earn certificates and that's the whole unique thing about this project series. So just to give you a rough idea, in all the videos that we'll be uploading in this project series, there will be at least one task for you to solve. So let's just say that we are uploading about 10 videos in this whole project series, then you have this opportunity to earn 10 different certificates if you are able to complete all these 10 tasks and this will surely help you strengthen your profile based on the certificate that you will be getting for all the hard work and the time that you will be putting into it. But let's say that if you're a complete beginner and want to start everything from scratch in order to first learn everything from basic and then implement your ideas to such cool projects, then you can also join our live training programs we offer at Spartificial. So just to demonstrate what I'm trying to say, I'll click on this Spartificial.com link and then go to this programs catalog. Currently we are accepting registration for these three programs. So we prefer the project based learning approach for our, all of our students where we first teach you all the concepts you need in order to solve any kind of project that we are displaying in this particular page starting from extreme basics all the way up to the advanced level you need for that respective project. So we started in this way so that you will be able to solve the final project in a proper way. So all the guidance and everything this is the live training program that we have where instructors from top-notch institutes of India are going to teach you the concepts and with the help of assignments you will keep on testing your knowledge throughout this weeks of program that we are having. So for the first project it's a 16 weeks nano degree program with a 10 weeks of internship. So yeah that's one thing that is very much unique that is if you are able to perform really well in all this kind of training program that you are going to participate you get this opportunity to take participation in the research internship. So that's the one thing that I wanted to mention about. So the first project is depending on the reinforcement learning. The second project is for the image processing part. And the third one is very much similar to what we are going to deal with this project. You will be seeing that in a while. But let's say that if you are interested, if you are a complete beginner and if you want to make a career transition or just want to see how is artificial intelligence applied onto this kind of cool projects on space and science, you can surely go ahead and whatever is interesting you, you can just go ahead and register yourself. So everything from scratch will be going to teach you and then implement that whole idea onto the final project. And that's all about like, you know, the programs that we offer from our side for all the beginners who want to just test their knowledge of the space and how can they implement it with the help of artificial intelligence to solve this kind of cool projects. But now coming back to our project over here, we are going to go ahead and detect ships using satellite images with the help of deep learning. So now this project ID and the project name is unique to this particular project that you will be needing while submitting your final notebook with the help of a Google form that you can find at the end of this notebook. So I'll be showing you how to fill that form at the end of the video. But right now, let us just continue ahead and start with the data set and the aim of this whole project. So we are going to deal with this Airbus data set of ship detection. So over here, you can just go ahead and read everything you want. But just to give you a very basic summary, what we are having is we are having this satellite images with us with different amount of ships in it. Either there will be some ships, there will be no ships at all. So I'll be showing you all of it step by step in this whole project video. But a basic idea is if there are a particular amount of ship in the whole image, then we are going to detect it and put a bounding box around it. So how are you going to do all this task is what I'm going to explain in this whole project. And then at the end, we are going to build and train a unit model from scratch for this image segmentation task. Don't worry if you're not able to get the idea about like, you know, what is the image segmentation? I'll be explaining you that very quickly in a while. So first of all, let me just start by adding the data set to this kernel. So I'll simply say that I want to add my ship detection or Airbus ship detection and simply click on this plus sign. So it will add the whole data set onto my kernel. And then what are the files that we are having? If I want to notice this before we go ahead, we are having test folder, train folder, it contains respective images. And then again, we are having this train ship segmentation CSV file and the sample submission CSV file. We are going to look into this in much more detail in a while. 
but now let us just continue so first of all before we begin our project let us understand this idea behind what is the image classification object detection and the semantic segmentation or the image segmentation these kind of ideas if you are hearing for the first time then these are some of the concepts that is most common in the applications of machine learning in computer vision field so what is the idea behind image segmentation object detection and the image segmentation so image classification is basically about it determines what are the certain types of object present in that image so let's say if this image is containing a cat or a dog so that consists of an image classification problem then over here if you want to put a bounding box around the objects then this is called object detection but now if you want to classify an object in an image with each pixel so pixel wise classification is called image segmentation and the thing that we are going to use in this particular project is the semantic segmentation along with the bounding box you will be getting this idea while i'll i'll be going through this whole project and explain to you everything step by step but just to give you a rough idea okay so this kind of box is going to be the object detection and then if we classify each pixel of an object like this over here i'm coloring all of my dog in the orange and the cat with the yellow so this is called image segmentation now there are two types of segmentation that is semantic segmentation and instance segmentation in semantic segmentation we are going to classify let's say if there were two dogs so both of the dogs will be painted in the same pixel let's say orange pixel and the cat is painted in the yellow pixel you can also paint the background in some different pixels and say let's say everything is black so this is called semantic segmentation where we are taking each class and coloring them with the same pixels then comes instant segmentation so over here let's say that we are having two dogs so both of these dogs will be having different colors and that's how we say that we are taking instance we are taking same type but different objects and having different assigning different pixels to it just to give you a even better visualization to this example i am having one more image over here for you to look into this so what we are doing over here is we are first of all in the first image classifying that there are camels and the man in this image and also localizing them where it is existing and then in the object detection what i'm doing is i'm locating my camels in a different way this is my camel 1 this is my camel 2 this is my camel 3 and this is my man now this is a very basic idea like you know what is the idea behind the classification localization and the object detection but now coming on to the like semantic segmentation part and the instant segmentation part you can clearly see the difference see over here we are labeling all the sky with a particular dark blue pixel for the water we are using the light blue pixels and for every camel we are painting it in a green pixel for the man we are painting the whole man in the blue pixel and for the sand again we are having the gray pixel but now if we talk about the instant segmentation everything else is same apart from the camels because we are having three different camels for each camel we are having a different pixel that we are assigning to it and this is called instant segmentation and this is the most toughest or the most complex to use but that's the whole idea that we are having before we jump into our actual data so yeah that's all idea behind image segmentation object detection and the classification so now we can just go ahead and import some of the libraries we'll be needing in this notebook i'll start by import warnings and then say warnings dot filter warnings and ignore so this kind of code is going to basically help me filter out any kind of warning messages uh, or the unwanted outputs i don't want to see from the kaggle for the warning part i am simply filtering out such warnings and ignoring it so that i am not having any unwanted outputs while i'm running my coding cells and then i'll be going ahead and import the basic or the most needed ones uh, the libraries for the any kind of data science project so i'll be starting by importing os i need this import os in order to fetch the images from the directories of train and test so that's the reason that i'm using my uh, os and then import numpy as np then import pandas as pd numpy for handling arrays and deal with the linear algebra and pandas because we are also having the csv file we want to deal with it so i'll also be using pandas for that and then for the visualization purpose the most basic ones we always need is matplotlib and the cbot so import matplotlib dot pyplot as plt and then also import cbot as sns so these are the most basic ones or the most needed ones in any kind of data science project so that's why we are done importing this and then for particularly this project we also need to do image processing and for that i am choosing sk image 
and I am going to import some of the things from SK image for us in this whole notebook. We'll be needing it. So I'll be starting from uh, let's say from SK image dot IO import IM read. This is simply going to help me read the image path and convert it into numpy arrays. It's going to help me for that. And then from SK image dot segmentation, I want to import mark boundaries. And this is going to help me mark boundaries around the shapes that we are going to see in this in a while. We are just going to see this, but just to give you a very brief idea, we'll be using this particular thing in order to mark the boundaries around the shapes that we'll be seeing. And then I'll also say that from SK image dot util, I want to import montage. So this is going to help me create montage of the images. And then last but not the least, I'll be using SK image from SK image dot morphology. I'll be importing labels. So you'll be seeing the use of it quick in a while, but right now just ignore something if you're not able to understand over here for the image processing part if you're completely new to this. But yeah, we'll be uh, having a brief idea while we are dealing with uh, this in the coding part. And now because uh, again the memory is going to be an issue over here, so I'll also import the garbage collection. So import garbage collection and I'll enable it for the memory management purpose. And just in case if you are not familiar with any kind of these things and if you want to have a head start about what this kind of libraries or modules do, I have also given links for the things that I'm using over here. So you can just go ahead and check out any things that you are not familiar with. But anyway, I'm also going to share about it while we'll be looking into these codes. So yeah, that's the basic libraries, some of the libraries that I've imported for this notebook. And now let us just go ahead and explore the data set. So over here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create train and test image directories. So for that, what I'll do is I'll just write the comment and say train and test directories directories okay and then for train image directory what i'll do i'll simply go ahead and copy the string folder and simply paste it okay i also need this but i don't need uh, by chance i copied the first image instead of the folder but yeah that's what i need to do from input from from this particular file i need train folder Similarly, for test image directory, I need exactly the same thing because we can see the only thing that is changed is inside this main file we are having test v2 instead of train v2. So I just need to do one change that is instead of this train, I need to write test. So we are done creating the train and test image directories. And now the next step is to getting into the train directory. So I'll say getting to train directory so i'll say that because inside the train directory we are having the images so i'll say train images is equal to now i also mentioned that we use os in order to fetch this kind of files from any kind of directory so i'll be using os and the thing we use is called list directory i'll be getting the list of all the items inside this directory so the directory we are interested to look into is train image tier so now it's going to create a list of this all images we are having. So I'll just simply check. So yes, we are having this list. But if you see, it's not uh, in a sorted way, right? We are not getting this particular files first. This is some uh, random file that we are getting over here. So what I'll do is I'll also sort this thing. So in order to do this, what I'll say is train images dot sort. And now this is going to help me get my outputs of train images the way I want. So yeah, now this is the first image, that's my second image. So now, now I'm pretty much confident that yes, I can go ahead and deal with this. And now just to see how many uh, length of, uh, what is the total length of this directory or let's say how many images are present in this directory and what are some of the inputs uh, in this directory. I'll just copy and paste this line over here. So what I'm doing is, I am going to print the total, the length of the train images present in that particular uh, variable that, that we have made and then we are going to display some of the first five samples. So if I go ahead and run it, so there are a total of uh, 192556 images in this train directory. And here is how first five sample images look like. 
सो इन द ट्रेन इमेज वी आर एज ए मैंशन दिस में फर्स्ट सेकेंड थर्ड फोर्थ फिफ्थ दैट्स एक्जेक्टली वॉट वी आर सींग ओवर हियर सो या दिस इज हाउ वी आर गेटिंग इन टू द ट्रेन डिरेक्टरी गोइंग अ हेड वट आई डू इज आई आई बी यूजिंग फॉर लुप टू जनरेट इमेज टू अंडरस्टैंड हाउ दिस डेटा इज गोइंग टू लुक लाइक एंड जस्ट टू सेव माई टाइम आई एम नॉट गोइंग टू राइट एवरीथिंग फ्रॉम स्क्रैच Rather, I'll just explain to you what we are going to do. So, I am creating a figure of fig size fifteen comma fifteen. You can just play around with this, depending on how you like to see your output, and then give the main title in the subplot as train images with some extra things that we can play around again. That is, I am creating the bold font size. I am increasing and changing color from black to red, and then I am looping into this train image directory, and then I am just concatenating the strings because. in this string image dir what i am having is the folder link i am having the link to this folder and then i am creating the slash to read the next files inside this folder and this train image is basically containing this kind of files inside this train directory and this i is going to reference the first second third and similar files in this uh, particular code and that's how i am going to get the images this i am read as you can see over here is going to convert first of all this train image directory and this training image whatever i'm going to read this whole path into the numpy array and then this dot i am show is going to help me actually display that output and then for every images i am having a title of this image particularly whatever is the label given to or whatever we call this thing the final names we are giving to this image we are having it Uh, with the bold output and i'm also turning off the axis because i don't want to see any kind of labelings uh, written uh, at the border and using this tight layout to have a proper output in the subplots you can also use uh, adjust subplots and uh, use h space and w space to have proper space between your images but i used to like tight layout because i very much good with the output that i'm having so yeah that's what we have done what we are doing is we are using this loop for 16 times and creating 16 images whatever we are seeing over here the first 16 images what has been displayed with the respective names on the top of it so that's the basic idea that this is how our data is looking if we look over here in this two images we are not having any kind of shapes over here we are having only one shape over here we can see there are multiple shapes in this image then uh, again over here this is the deck over here we can see there are a few shapes uh, again then there are no shapes no shapes no shapes there are a lot of images with no shapes and some images with multiple shapes so yeah that's about this data and now we can just move ahead and look into some other data files given to us so we are already done looking at how the training folder is looking like we don't need test right now let us look at the segmentations like what are the labels we are having for the respective training uh, images so for that we are having the csv file so let's just see what are the content of the csv file and for that i'll be using pandas data frame and uh, over here i'll just write a comment that i want to see train ship segmented mask so in order to look at that i need my mask data frame i am going to create it with the help of pandas and say read csv and pass in this url and i want to display first 10 data points that has been there inside this csv file so there are basically two columns one is going to show us the image id that's nothing but the image name that we are having and then on the right side we are having the encoded pixels so now if you are not aware about this encoding don't worry about it i'll be explaining to you in a while but right now what we are having is we are having some image ids and respective encoded pixels so wherever there will be shift we are encoding it into a particular format and then we'll have to decode this pattern in order to obtain shifts over here and over here or wherever is present in the image Or let's let us look into some conclusions that we are having based on this. So here we can see that some images or some image IDs are repeated. So if we can notice that this particular thing, so zero 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 triple zero one nine four a two d dot jpg is uh, basically repeated for five times. One two three four five. Yes. So it's repeated for five times, and over here encoded pixels are different all the time. So what does it mean? it is because that we are given mask for each ship in one image so in if in one image there are let's say five ships so it will be given with five different image ids and with its respective place that where exactly my ship lies so this segmented version is just locating the ships rather than the overall full image okay 
So now if I just want to explain what I'm saying, if I look into the same uh, 0, 0, 0, 00019482d dot jpeg, if I just zoom in a bit, over here we can see there is 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5, there are about 5 shapes in this image, right? Now, each one shape, each shape is having the segmented version. So instead of this, we are having the segmented version of it located in the inside this data frame as the encoded pixels. Don't worry about it. I'll be explaining to you what is the run length encoding and decoding means. And then you will be having a more clear idea about what I'm trying to say. But right now, uh, from this first slide, we can say that, okay, yeah, over here, depending on how many image IDs are there, it basically represents the number of shapes we are having in that particular image. And these NAND values are simply uh, denoting that there are no shapes in that particular image. And we can now combine all of this mask, all of this mask and create a one single mask for a respective training image ID. And before that, we need to make ourselves comfortable with this encoded format that has been given to us. And for that, we are going to go in the process of understanding what is run length encoding and decoding. And now let me simply bring all of it into one frame, the data that I have to explain or the information that I have to convey to you about run length encoding and decoding, because I don't want any kind of breaks in between uh, so that I can break any link while I'm explaining, because this concept is really very unique for this particular project. And we need to understand in order to convert the given data into a format that our model is going to understand, because see, our model building or training or testing is really very easy if you know the basic syntax of how the layers in the model are built in the deep learning, how the training is done, how testing is done, how we use callbacks and all that thing is going to be pretty similar in any kind of deep learning projects. But when we come to the data pre-processing steps, so some kind of things will always be unique depending on the data, the type of data that we are having. In this case, we are having the encoded pixels. So before we even go ahead, we need to understand what exactly that kind of pixels mean, what, what is the idea behind that, so that we are able to pre-process that data in a way that our model is going to understand. We are able to construct an overall segmented mask that wherever there is an image in the training part, and if ship is located, so wherever there is the ship, we'll be able to get the segmented version of that ship in the whole image. So we have to build that data in such a way that our model is going to understand. So in, for that, we first need to understand what is the idea of run length encoding. So please pay proper attention if you are completely new to what is RLE and what is run length decoding. So run length encoding is basically a compression technique where compression is basically we are just squeezing in the data to reduce the size. That's a basic idea about the compression. Now what is the meaning of lossless compression? So lossless compression is a type of compression where we are able to retrieve the original data without any kind of loss from the compressed version and run length encode the lossless compression. So what is the idea? Like how does run length encoding and decoding work? So if I just tell you in layman terms, whenever we are compressing, we are calling it as an encoding and whenever we are decompressing, we are calling it that decoding in this particular project. Okay. But now a specific way through which we should do is called run length. Now what is the idea behind this run length? So just to give you an example so that you all are understanding in a better way. Let's say that this is my data. And in this data that we can see that there is a kind of a repetitive things that is there in my data. So there are three times A, one time B and four times C. So now what I can do is I can literally convert this data into the run length encoding format where I'm counting for how many times my data has been repeated. I count that number and write it just next to the actual data. So if my data is A and how many times this data has been repeated? It has been repeated for three times. So I'm writing A and three like this. So I'm converting this three places in, into only just two places. So I'm decreasing the size. And then for this B, we can see that for this one B, I'm having two different boxes over here. For one box, I am now encoding into two box. Now, this is something which we call as a negative compression. If the overall, if the overall size of this encoding version is greater than the original data, then it is called negative compression. I'll be talking about that a bit later. But then if we look at this, that we are having C for four times. So now that is that four boxes has been converted to only two boxes. So that's how we are overall 
reducing the size of the data by using run length encoding and when the, when is this run length encoding very useful when we are having the data such that there are having long runs of the same kind of values in your data then we can perform run length encoding in order to squeeze in the size of the data that if you are having let's say 10 times a then 11 times b 14 times c so i am converting all of this kind of data into just four blocks or six blocks 2 for a 2 for b and 2 for c right so this is 2 for a 2 for b and 2 for c so that's a basic idea about run length encoding now what is the meaning of decoding if we are able to convert this format to that format that is basically called run length decoding so run length because i am converting this three runs for a back into triple a like this a a a similarly 1b there is only 1b then 4c means there are 4 times c but now representing this run length encoding format can change depending on the data that we are having okay over here i can also write 3 first a later 1 first b later right so this kind of pattern may change but the basic idea of about the run length encoding and decoding is that this is the lossless compression technique where with the help of what is the length of the run of a particular data we are trying to compress the original data and in order to bring it back we are using something called as run length decoding so this is a basic idea about what we do in the run length encoding and decoding i hope everyone has understood this part because again as i mentioned if you will not be getting this part you will be clueless like what is even happening in this whole video but just to explain this part properly explain this part properly i'll show you one more example that we are having so now let us just look into this 10 by 10 image we are having that is completely black and white which basically means that either your pixel will be black or white in this whole image and let us say that black pixels are represented by one and white pixels by zero so now keeping this all things in mind we have to convert this image data into the rle format but now there are multiple variations through which we could have done it so we could have either go across the rows and then convert each and every rows into the rle format or we can scan across these columns and convert these columns into the rle format or else what we are going to do in this project we are going to flatten this whole image so this basically image is going to look something like this and then we are going to perform rle on it so it totally depends up to the user how he or she wants to do this encoding but now for this particular example what we are going to follow is we are going to consider a row wise rle so now for each and every row i am going to convert it into the rle format so saying that black pixels are one and white pixels are zero we start from the first row so first row there are 10 pixels and all of them are black so we can say that there are 10 pixels and the values of that pixels are one so we are encoding it using rle into 10 1 right just like we had in the above example a 3 so now like that we are saying 10 1 that's what we are saying for 10 times we are having 1 so again we can switch these positions we can say that this one has been repeated for 10 times just like over here right we are saying what is the pixel and then how many times it has been repeated over here what we are saying is how many pixels are repeated and what is the number that has been repeated okay what is the number of the pixel that has been repeated so we can twist this around we can write this first this later it all boils down to how you want to do it okay so in this particular example i am saying first i am counting the length of the run and then what is the pixel that has been repeated that's what i'm writing later so for the first row i am getting 10 1 for the second row i'll be getting 4 black so 4 1 2 0 4 1 then for the third row it will be 3 1 4 0 and 3 1 so that's how i am going to convert each and every row into the rle format and then i am going to count the total pixels at the end that if over here see this image is basically 10 by 10 so there are a total of 100 pixels and after converting it to rle format what are the total amount of pixels we are getting are we decreasing the overall size of the image or not that's what we have to figure out okay but right now see we have converted everything till third row but now if i specifically talk about let's say either the eighth row or the ninth row or let's say fifth row over here there is no continuous pattern of either just blacks or just whites it is a continuous cycle of black and white black and white right so in this kind of thing you will see that the total pixels that we are using for this row are only 10 but if we look 
over here we can see that we are using more than 10 pixels if we count it it's 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 13 14 15 16 17 18 we are almost doubling the amount of size for this particular row and so this is really a good example when should we use rle and when should we not so if your run length is huge in a particular image then it's obviously that for these kind of images you use it but at times we can also get this kind of thing but if this kind of thing happens less as compared to all the other rows then the overall size will surely decrease and that's the main aim of this RLE that to decrease the size of the uh, overall data so in this case let us try to figure out after converting each and every row that I just mentioned into the RLE format what will be the total number of pixels that we'll be getting at the end of each rows and then we'll just sum, sum it up together and see if we are getting the final value less than 100 or not so if we just scroll down, I have written a small Python program for this. So over here you can see that we are having row RLE list and every entries of this list is basically representing the original image row converted into the RLE data. So now the first row was everything was black. So that's why we can see 10 and 1 written over there. For the 10th data again everything is black so you can see the 10th input is also 10 and 1. But this 11 input in this list is basically representing what is the total number of boxes that is going to be equipped. So for each number there will be one box that will be equipped. So now my task is to count for each rows how many boxes are there and then together if we sum up all these boxes what is the total value that I am getting. So now that's the basic task that I am trying to perform and now let's just say that each of these box represents a pixel. Then I am having this pixels variable over here which is basically again a list I'm using list comprehension to create the values like you know in the first row how many boxes are going to be there so there will be two in the second there will be six so how will I do it in terms of python coding so as I mentioned I'm using list comprehension where I am performing for loop inside this list where I'm saying for every row inside this row RLE list if that row is not equal to total then you split each and every row with the help of space and after splitting what will happen that this if I'm splitting then it will be containing two elements now that is 10 and 1 so that's why I'm finding length what is the length of the row after performing splitting and this length is going to be equal to the number of boxes for that particular row after converting it to the RLE so this will be reading it as 2 this will be 6 again 6 all the way down till this as 2 so now these pixels are representing the list of total number of boxes in each row after converting it to the RLE data. And now my task is to convert this list into the numpy array and then use dot sum in order to find what is the total number that I am getting after I sum up this total number of boxes in each row. And then what I am doing is I am appending it in the pixels whatever is the value of the sum that I am getting. So that now if I am about to create pandas data frame with the help of dictionary so I am creating a dictionary which will be used in order to create the pandas data frame as I mentioned where first column is representing the row RLE data so it's going to consist of this data where total will take the value of the pixels that has been appended the sum of the pixels or sum of the box that has been appended to the pixels the list of the pixel and therefore I am also having the second column in this data frame as pixels where all the values of the total number of boxes in each row will be mentioned along with the final the total value and I am just using pd.dataframe in order to create this data frame with the help of dictionary and also just to mention the rows okay this is my first row second row third row I am just creating this uh, rldf.index plus one plus equal to one I am incrementing all the values of index by one and then I am showing the final data frame and if I just run this I am going to get this kind of output. So each, this is the row number I am getting. This is the respective RLE for that row from the image data and these are the number of boxes for each rows after converting it to RLE. And now if we find the total, we are getting only 84 boxes. Initially there were a total of 100 boxes. So now we can see the use of RLE. If this 84 was greater than 100, then there would be the result of, this would be the result of negative compression but now we are able to compress our data properly this number may not seem really very much but let's say that if we are just having more amount of whites and less amount of blacks uh, in this total 
basic this kind of image we are having then we would be even improving our this result but without discussing about it if we just talk about how rle works i hope now everyone is clear with the idea of the rle the one thing you can also like you know play around with this code is you can figure out how can you remove this last 11 from this particular thing it's totally up to you if you want to do this as a part of your task you can do it but yeah this doesn't seem good right that the 11th row in this uh, thing is total and 84 but if you want you can keep it like this it really doesn't matter but just to play around if i ask you to remove this 11 from this thing then how will you do it and i just hope that you understood the idea behind what is run length encoding and decoding now and if you did actually understand this i would really appreciate if you could just pause this video over here and drop a like on this video and also comment that yes i have understood the idea behind what is run length encoding and decoding it will really help us motivate by looking at the number of likes that we are receiving it will show your support towards us and also this kind of comments are going to help us realize that our viewers are actually viewing our videos properly in depth and it will help us motivate to create this kind of content for you in future so please go ahead and drop a like right now and also leave a comment if you did understood the idea behind run length encoding and decoding till now so thanks for dropping the like and the comment and now let us just proceed with the data set that we are having and try to understand like based on a particular image in the training sample let's just say that in this training samples we are choosing this particular image so first of all let me just display it to you how does this image look like so i am simply going to go ahead and call the path of that image read that image and display it so i have already written a code for it where i am going inside the training image directory and calling this particular image id and because this is the complete image path using i am read onto this image path is going to convert it into the image array and then i am going to simply create a figure of the size 15,8 and then display this numpy array using pld.im show and then just showing that figure that we have obtained by doing this so here we are having this particular image id we are able to display it and now it is consisting of two different shapes so now if you remember that we had already created a masks data frame which consists of image ids and encoded pixels so now it should contain for the same image id so this will image id will be present in that particular data frame for two times because there are two shapes and it will be representing what is the location of the shape in that image so before we go into that particular part let us first identify what is the shape of this image or basically what are the shapes of any kind of image in this training example so i'll simply say that image array dot shape and it will just display the overall shape for me so it is of 768 by 768 with three channels so now if we just look into the masks data frame that we were having so we are having this kind of huge numbers and then 17 and again huge numbers 33 huge numbers 33 so what is all these things representing so we are trying to understand this by taking a proper look into this kind of rle masks that we are having the rle versions of the mask that's what i should actually say so now going ahead now what i'm doing is now i simply am trying to calculate or generate the masks of rle from that data frame so what i'm using is i am using masks dot query so dot query is going to filter out all the image ids and the respective encoded pixels for this label of the image or the name of the image or the image id in that particular column so filter out all the image ids for this particular name and generate encoded pixels and display it over here so in order to do this i am going to run this cell so i am seeing that yes i am having two different rle masks for this particular image id because as i already mentioned there are two shapes there should be two different masks for it and now what we are going to do is in order to even visualize this thing better because over here we are seeing this dot 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 i want to see the complete rle mask for each shape so for that what i'll do is i'll simply go ahead 
and create a very small code over here where I am creating an empty list which will be containing all the masks for the shapes that we are having for this image and this counter is just going to help me understand if this is my mask 1 or mask 2. So by writing this code and running it, I am getting the full mask 1 and full mask 2. So because this is a longer version and this is the shorter version, we can just say that the mask 1 is representing this particular ship and mask 2 is representing this small ship. But how is it even working? So for that what I'll do is I'll just take example of only one mask and try to split this thing. So what do we get after doing that? Let's see. So I am taking mask list and the first entry of that list is my mask one. And I am simply going to split this data. So now it's going to just create comma everywhere wherever there is a space in between. So if I just run this thing and look at the split that I am having after this command. So I am having this long values, then a short value, then again a long value and this short value. So what is all this thing representing? So let us understand that. So this data is showing us the start pixels and the lens where we can think ship is going to exist in the original image. So now as I had mentioned earlier that we are going to flatten this image and how do I know that we are flattening this image because we know that the dimensions of the image are it's basically 768 by 768 image with three channels. So if I'm having only 768 for rows and 768 for columns, how can we get this long numbers, right? So because of that, what we can think of this is that this image is basically converted into a 1D image and then these are my starting pixels that okay yeah this from this particular pixel I know that my ship is going to exist but for how many pixels after it my ship is going to be there in that image. So over here this one is showing the run length okay so that 56010 there is only one pixel that is going to represent ship in that particular image and now then I am going to another point that is 56777 so this is again a new starting point where my ship is going to exist in that particular original image for run length of 3. So from 56777 to 56779, I am again going to get my ship in the original image. So that is what I am explaining over here that for example, 56777 and 3 is basically showing the pixels 56777, 56778 and 56779 contributes to the ship in the original image. And now our target is to create an image with all these pixels which is denoting a shape in the final image as one and remaining everything in that image should be converted to zero. So if I'm trying to explain this a bit properly, I'll just scroll up to this particular image and now my task is wherever the ship is existing based on this idea about the starting pixels and the run length, I will be converting wherever the ship is existing, I'll convert all of this to ones and everything apart from the ships in the image, I'll be converting it to the background and that is zero. Everything apart from the ship will be just considered as zero and wherever I'll be seeing this ship, I'll convert that to ones so that I am able to convert that particular encoded pixels into the segmented mask. And then I'll also do this for the other ship that I'm having. First of all, I'm doing only for this ship. And then I'll also do it for the smaller ship. And then I'll add this data together. I'll add this NumPy errors together to create the overall mask for this respective training image. And then we are just going to copy paste this idea for all the training samples we are having in this project. So in order to explain you this idea a bit more better, let me just scroll a bit below. This were all the assumptions or the conclusions uh, we were having till now that this is how we can produce a mask for a respective image. And now we can simply go ahead and start our process of creating this kind of mask for every image. So for that what I need to do, I need to simply grab the starting pixels, take the run length and also find what will be the ending pixels like based on the runs I will able to find the ending pixels that okay yeah I am starting at this point and I am ending at this point because the run length is 1 
then I'm starting from this point all the way going up to five, six, seven, seven, nine because the run length is three. So I'll be able to find what is the final pixels where I should be ending, where my shape is going to exist. So for that, what I'm going to simply do is I'm going to just separate all these pixel values, the starting pixel values into one array and all the run lengths into an another array. So the way through which I can do this is by using this piece of code. And also one thing that I'm doing over here is I'm converting this string to numbers because I'll be using subtraction or addition over here in order to get the ending values of the pixels. So our main task over here is, as I mentioned, we just need to separate all the starting pixels into one array and all the run lengths into different array. And in order to do this in Python, what I'll do is I'm having this split list and then inside the split list, I can see that starting from the zeroth index, all the alternate index are the values which contains the starting pixel values. And then in the same list, in the same split list, starting from the first index, remember in Python, we start from the first element is basically the zeroth index, second element hence becomes the first index. So in the same split list from the first index, all the alternate values are my run lens. So that's what I'm going to do in order to separate this split list into two different arrays, I am going to perform list comprehension. And then in order to get all the values starting from the zeroth index and all the alternate values after that, in order to grab them, I am going to use the list indexing. And this is how we exactly grab starting from the zeroth index because here I'm not passing any value over here. It basically assumes that I'm giving a value over here as zero. And then, I am telling to skip all the alternate values by passing this value over here as two. And then this is going to give me all the values for starting pixels. And that is what I'm going to store it in the starts array. Similarly for this split starting from one, that is my first index. I am going to again skip all the alternate values and storing these pixels inside my lens array. So my this starts is the starting pixel array and this length is the run length array. And now if I just run this and show you the final output, note that I have convert all these values to integers using this numpy array function where I'm just passing that for X in these two things. I am saying that create an array for it and then just saying that the data type of it should be an integer. So as you can see that we have simply separated this data. So 5601056777, all of them, we can see it over here and then all the run lengths starting from one, three, all the way down to three, one should be over here. So one, three, three, one, all the data in between for the run lengths are exactly over here. So now we are ready to create the final end pixel values. I'll simply again, grab this coding that I've already done and paste it over here. So I just explain this with the help of example that 56010 is simply going to say that I am starting at 56010 and I'm also ending at 56010. Then 56777 with this three is saying that I want to start from 56777 and I want to end at 56779. Similarly, 57544, it's going to go for the six length. So I'm going to start from 57544. This is my first pixel value and then for additional five times I am going to have my pixels which should be converted to one. So basically that's how I'm finding my ending pixels. So in order to do this, so this one basically means that okay yeah I am staying over here only. This three is basically saying that yeah I am including this plus adding two more pixels to it to have a total run length of three. So what I'm doing is from the starting point, I am just subtracting one to get to this particular point and then adding the total run length to it to get the end point. So just to give you an example, let's say that I'm considering five, six, triple seven. So this is my five, six, triple seven. And if I add three to this, I'll be getting five, six, seven, eight, zero, but I want five, six, double seven, nine, because I'm starting from five, six, triple seven. I'm starting from this point and going additional two more. That's how this total three is going to be made. And therefore I am subtracting one from the starting value 
and then I am adding the length to get the ending points. And just to visualize this even better, I have created a pandas data frame over here that will show you what is the starts and the lengths and the ends for some of the examples for the first 10 examples that we are having. So if I just load this, I am just considering the first 10 examples over here. So this starting point is 56010. This one length is going to tell me that I am going to end at that same pixel. If I take this particular example, so 59846, I am going to start from this and add additional 10 pixels and convert all of them to one. And therefore, if I do this, I'll be ending up at this particular point. You can do this math and you will be seeing that yes, exactly we are landing over here. So if I just want to show you. So 59846. 59846 and then I simply add 10 more because this is already one total of there are 11 pixels right so one I have already considered so I am left with only 10 so if I add 10 to this I am getting 59856 and this is exactly what is shown over here 59856 so now this is the idea that what we are going to do we are going to get starting points based on the lengths that we are having where shape is going to exist in the original image, I am also able to find the ending points. And now my task is to use for loop and convert all this start to end part to one and remaining everything will be converted to zero. So what I am going to do now is, first of all, I'll need a 1D array of the size 768 times 768. It will be a 1D array and I'll just fill it with complete zeros. And only from the start to end points that I am having, I'll convert all such values to 1. So for mask 1 that we were having in the ship uh, for the longer ship in that image, we are going to convert that particular ship into a proper mask. So what I'm saying over here is now I'll just go ahead and create an array of zeros and then just fill all the start till ends with ones and everything will just else will just remain as zeros. So if you can see of over this coding cell, the first line is creating all the values inside this array of 768 times 768 with zeros. And then I am zipping all the starts and ends values that I have created and saying that for each and every start till end, replace these zeros with ones and everything else will just stay as zero. So image from start till n plus one. Why n plus one? Because we know that this value is exclusive. It will take an integer value just before this. And I want to convert that to one and everything else should be zero as shown. So now we are successfully done running this particular code cell. And now if you want to look how the output is going to look like. I am just going to have this code and show you that if I am having 56776 six, six, till 56781. So I am choosing like, you know, I am trying to display that we are going to have from 56777 to 56779. I am going to have ones and apart from that, I am going to have zeros in between this particular length. And I have also written a comment over here that the output should be 0, 1, 1, 1, 0. Why? Because I am going to start from 56776. Six, so over here, we don't have any kind of shape. So it should be zero. But then five, six, double, triple seven will have the shape. So one, then five, six, seven, seven, eight, five, six, seven, seven, nine. All of them are going to have shapes. And then again, five, six, seven, eight, zero will not be having any shape. And then five, six, seven, eight, one is not even counted. And that's why we will not be even having the output for this particular thing. So this is my starting point. This is my ending point. But this is inclusive, but this is exclusive. So if I just print this, as expected, we are getting 0, 0, 1, 0. So now I hope the idea is clear. So wherever there is shape now, I have converted all such pixels to 1 and everything else, the background has been changed to 0. And again, just to make you realize that this has been done on only the largest shape that I was having in that particular image. I have done this thing only for this thing. So I have just created a shape segmented mask that I have created every other thing in this background as zeros and only this shape is now going to be converted to one. 
So you will be able to visualize this when I'm running the new coding cells. But now what I wanted to show you is that still the other shape is remaining. We haven't even touched that other shape. So what should we do over there? So I am also going to copy paste this whole idea for the smaller shape as well. And because we have stored this in the mask list, and this was the second entry in that mask list. So I'm going to use mask list dot one and use the same exact process of splitting, converting into integers, finding the start and the end lengths, and then use np dot zeros and from start to end I'll create all this ship pixels to one and everything else again as zeros. And then finally I'll be combining both of this segmented image so that I'm getting the final output as the mask of that respective training image. So for that what I'll do is first of all because I want to display this as a proper image so I need to convert this shape from this 1D to 2D. So I'll be reshaping this image. So image one, so image, basically this image is the respective mask that we have created for the larger shape. This image one is for the smaller shape and I'm reshaping it both and reshaping it into 768, 768, the original image shape that it was having. And the final output should be the summation of both of these things. So wherever the shape was going to exist, I am going to be placing 1111 one, one, one everywhere in that particular place and everything else is zero. So now if I'm checking the final shape, what is the output of the final shape and what is the dimensions of that final shape? So this is my final array. Everywhere we can see zeros because a lot of background is there as compared to the shapes in a particular image. That's why we are able to see lots of zeros. But this is the shape and this is the two dimensional image. We have not yet mentioned like the dimensions uh, for the channels, right? We have not included the channels. We are just saying what is the shape of this image. So it's 768 by 768 with two dimensions total. So now we are just going to add an extra dimension by using NP dot uh, I will be showing you that and it will just add one more, like it will add an extra channel to this. So if I just want to show this to you and along with that, I'll also display what is the final image that I'm having and the original image. I'll just use subplots to plot it. So just to show you what's happening, I'm having this particular code. So I'm using np.expandDeems to expand the dimensions of the final where I'm writing the second argument as minus one, where minus one basically takes what is the total number of dimensions available and it takes the, that, the last values index basically and convert that to one. So now I'm expanding the dimensions and I'm going to add the comma one at the end and then depending on the subplot size that I'm having 15 comma eight, that's the final figure size. And then I'm creating the subplots for the original image and then subplot for the mass generated from the run length encoded data, the final data that I'll be displaying along with the original image. Then over here, I'm using CMAP as blues are. I can also convert this to gray and show you how does a gray scale look like. And all the other images I'll be plotting in blues underscore R. But let's just visualize one image in the gray scale and see how it's going to look like. Again, the tight layout is just for the better visualization. And if I run this code, so yes, we are having a black and white image over here. But there is something off over here. We did add an extra dimension, but there is something off. The long shape is coming at the top and the shorter shape is coming at the bottom, but it should be the opposite way around. So what we are doing over here is we have not interpreted the ideas of the encoded pixels given to us in the masks data frame correctly. We just need to take now the transpose of this image, the final image, and it's going to, or it's like, you know, we can also take transpose of this and this and then add it together. So it's still going to give us the result uh, if we do the final transpose or like, you know, transpose of this and transpose of, of this and then add it together. So as I also mentioned this in the comments over here that yes, there is something off in this image and we just need to transpose this. And that's exactly how the data has been given in the masks data frame where everywhere, wherever we are seeing this encoded pixels, it is the transposed version of it. It's not the actual version. So I'll just need to pass the transpose of this image one and original image 
and uh, add them then together to create the final output and then visualize it. It should be working fine in that case. So what I'm trying to show over here is, I'll simply go ahead and capture this whole coding block. Everything is very much similar to what we have done earlier to this coding cell. And just I am adding is dot transpose dot transpose. This is for the first long shape and this is for the short shape. And then after using the transpose, adding the extra dimension. And now I'm going to use blues R and let's see how the output looks like. It should not be done correctly. Yes, as expected. So what we are saying is we are not exactly having a proper shape. Instead, we are having a bounding box around that shape and that bounding box is what is given to us in the encoded pixels, not the exact shape of the shape. So I hope that part is very much clear to us. So now we are going to follow this idea. We are going to build a function that is going to convert all the training images to its respective mass so that we are having enough data for our model to understand and learn from it. So in order to do this, what we can do is I can simply just go ahead and copy paste this whole function that I had created for this. First of all, I'll decode this mask that I'm having and then create this mask as an image. So I'm going to copy both of these functions and paste it over for you. So you can just go ahead and read about these comments. But the basic idea is first of all, I'm creating a function called as RLA decode, which is going to help me decode all the RLEs for a particular image ID. And then what I'm doing is I'm converting all these values uh, of this encoded pixels to one and everything else I'm just going to convert it to zeros. And then I'm simply going to add all these images of the RLA decode I am having for a particular image and then create a whole mask of that particular training image. So that's a very basic idea and I'm just adding one extra dimension and I'm returning this. So I'll just run this code and now I'll simply go ahead and check how this function is working. And for this, I'm already having my code ready. So I'll simply go ahead and paste it because we are running out of time. So yeah, over here, what I'm doing is I am saying that for num in three, four, five, six, first of all, I want to create for that particular image ID. I want to just create the query. I'll filter out all the encoded pixels for that image ID that I'm having and store it in the RLE underscore zero. And then I'm passing this in the functions mass as image over here. So what is going to do is it's going to decode this RLE format and then add all the ships RLE together after decoding it and create the final mask as the image. So oh, in this particular code, I am going to display the original third, fourth, fifth and sixth image in the training samples and its respective mask. For the original part, I am using this IAM rate going inside this train image directory and whatever image that I want to plot. So this num minus one is basically used because I know that in Python index starts from zero. So if I want to visualize my third image, I should say that index over here should be two because zero, one and two, that two is going to basically present the third image in that training sample. And the respective mass that I'm going to generate, I'm also going to display it and the final output, let's see how the final output is going to look like. So my mask as image has been generated over here and simply plotting it over here using blues R as the color map. So over here we can see that there was only one ship. So we got the respective mask for it over here. There were four ships, one, two, three, four. So four ships over here. And similarly in this next image, we are having no ships. So here also in mask, we are getting no ships at all. And similarly for this next image that we are having, we have converted its whatever is the ships in this image, I have converted it into the mass of this whole image. So now we have successfully created the functions that are going to take in the RLA data and convert it into the mask as we have seen above. And now we can begin with the splitting this data into training and validation data set. But before we go ahead and actually split this data, there are a few more steps that are needed to be performed out of which the first step that I'm going to perform right now is I'm going to create a new column in the mass data frame named as shape. And what my main motive over here is, I'll just 
write one in that shape column if the respective encoded pixel is containing any kind of RLE data. And if it is containing NAND value in it, then I want to write zero because I know that NAND value is representing zero shapes. So wherever I'll be seeing NAND values in the encoded pixels, I want to write it as zero and everything else that is basically the RLE data. Apart from NAND values, there are only RLE data. So wherever I see RLE data, I want to write one. So how am I even doing this thing? So I am saying that in mass data frame, create this new column named as ships and then I am applying my lambda function with the help of map onto this encoded pixel column and I am saying that in this encoded pixel column if any row is having a type of string in ships column write 1 else write 0. So RLA data is basically of a string type as mentioned over here and NAND value is not of a string type because it's a float type. So wherever there will be an NAND value in the encoded pixel, the respective ships count will basically be zero. And wherever there will be a string that is an RLE data, the respective ship count will be one. And in the mass data frame, we already know that image IDs are repeated over there. So for each image ID, there, if there are multiple ships, then it would be a repeated image IDs in that particular image ID column. So every image ID in that particular column will represent only one ship. And therefore I'm doing this step. And in order to show you what I have done, you can see that in place of this NN values for the encoded pixels, I am having the respective values of ship counts as zero. And over here, wherever the encoding pixels are having an RLE data, I am having one next to it. It basically says that for this particular image ID, I am having one ship that is encoded over here. On in this particular thing, I am having five image IDs that are repeated. But now this RLE data are different. And therefore, for each RLE data, I am saying that it is containing one ship. And now the next step, based on this, we are going to group all the image IDs that are same. And then for the respective ship counts, we are simply going to add them together. So for this particular image ID, there are five times it is repeated. So I'm going to club this thing together and I'm simply going to add this for five times. So one, two, three, four, five. If I add these five things together, I'll be getting the value of five. So now I'll create a new data frame and say that I'll club this image IDs if it's same and at the same time I'm also adding up the ship counts for that respective image IDs. So how am I going to perform it? I'm simply going to have this code and I'm using this group by function for the pandas data frame where I am saying that create a new data frame such that I am using the group by function on the masks data frame on image ID. So now I want to group by this image ID and then at the same time I'm also performing the sum on the ships column and then I'm just resetting the index so that my index again is in this particular format and then I'm also incrementing all these indexes by one so that the zero is gone and this is like one two three four five instead of zero one two three right and that's exactly what I'm trying to do over here and if I want to display this thing so we are having a new uh, data frame that is ready that it's not containing any kind of encoded pixels it is just containing the image id and the respective ship values so in this particular image id there are five ships in this image ID, there is only one ship. Similarly, in this two, there are zero ships. So I hope you have got the idea of what we are trying to perform over here. And now I'm simply going to create an extra column in this data frame and name it as has underscore ship, where it basically contains the information if a particular image ID is containing at least one ship in it or it is not containing any ship at all. So if it is containing at least one ship, then it will be having the value of one or else the value will be zero. And how am I going to do this in Python? I'll simply use this code that I'm having and I'm again using my lambda function along with map on the ships column of this data frame and creating a new column named as has underscore ship. And I'm saying that inside this ship column, any row over here is having a value greater than zero. It means at least one ship. I want to add the value in the has ship column as one. I'll simply say that the value is zero. And now if I just display this, so over here, we can see that if a particular image ID was not having any ships at all, the hash ship value is turned to zero. And whenever there is at least one ship, the value of hash underscore ship has been turned to one. So that's the basic idea that I have done over here. And now the next step is to find out what is the file size in kilobytes of each and every image that we are having in the training sample and the way to do this is again using the help of pandas data frame and 
I am creating a new column over here in the same data frame and I am saying that the name of this column is file size kb, file underscore size underscore kb and again using lambda function along with map on the image IDs and over here my task is to join the image path, the train image directory that I was having and the image IDs inside this train image directory and then by using this os.stat is going to help me give the size of that particular image and then I'm dividing it by 1024 to convert it into kilobytes and therefore if I run this cell it's going to go through each and every training samples we are having join these two things in this directory is join this first of all the image ID that it is having and then perform the size and convert it into KB and because I'm using lambda function with map on image IDs it's going to do for every image ID that we are having and therefore it's going to take a lot of time to run this thing so what I'll do is I'll just pause my video over here and I'll come back so we are back this code cell has been ran successfully and now you must be wondering that why are we even talking about the sizes of the training data that we are having so the basic idea that we are having right now we are going to remove all the training samples whose size is less than 35 KB. Now you can play around with this number but I'm just choosing this number and saying that any images that is having the file size that is less than 35 KB I'll say that it's a corrupt file and I'll just remove it from my data. So first of all let me show you the first five samples of this corrupt files. So I am saying just from this particular data frame I want to get the values whose file size is less than 35 and because I'm using dot head it's showing me first five samples of the images whose file size is less than 35 KB and now I'm going to simply use the last one over here in order to show you how this kind of files are looking like you can just play around with these files and see how it's looking like and then depending on that you can come up with a number over here and try to remove the data and now if I just display this to you so yeah, these are the kind of images that we are having which is not even needed in our data. So I'm just removing this. As I mentioned, you can play around with this number of 35 and you can come up with a better number. But yes, for now we have chosen this 35. And now because we want to remove this, what, what we are going to do is we are going to say that this unique image IDs is now only equal to unique image IDs where file size is greater than 35. So I want to keep only that part. So that's why I'm just doing this part and if I run this thing so that's my final unique image IDs that I'm having and now before we perform the train test split what I'll do is I also like I want to merge this unique image IDs with the mass data frame but in mass data frame because it's already containing this ships column I'm, I'll just get rid of that ships column so I'm going to retrieve the old mass data frame where I am dropping this ships column and then again just matching this index I am just incrementing all these indexes by one unit because I don't want to start from zero I want to start from one so yeah I am getting my masks data frame as it was and now our data is ready for the train and validation split so now what I'll do is I'll first of all split my unique image IDs into train and validation IDs and then I'll merge it with my mask data frame in order to create my respective training and validation data frames. So first of all let me just split my unique image IDs into the training and the validation IDs. I'm just using train test split from the sklearn.model selection and I'm using my stratify split over here because I know that stratify is used to split the data set into the train and test sets in a way that it preserves the sample proportions of the examples in each class as observed in the original data set. You will be understanding in a while that why am I using stratify train test split over here. But now I'll just run this set very quickly. And now I'll simply merge my this training and validation IDs with my mass data frame in order to create my train and validation data frame. So we are ready. We have finally created our train and validation data frames. Now let us just check the number of masks that we are having in both of this data frame. So there are about 1,62,000 training masks and 69,000 validation masks. And now let us just go ahead and visualize these ship counts. So I'm going to use my seaborn.count plot in order to visualize the total ship counts that I'm having in my training data frame. 
So if I run this cell, we can clearly see from this particular plot that there are a lot of images with zero ships in it as compared to multiple ships in it. So now this is a very imbalanced data that we are having. And that was the main reason why we also used stratified train test split because of this imbalance. And now we are going to perform random under sampling to generate a better balanced data that our model is going to understand. And for that what I'll do is I'll simply say that I'll create one extra column in this train data frame where I'm saying that I'm going to group all the ship counts. So now I'm going to instead of having random ship counts like this, I'm going to group it up and I'm going to group it up in such a way that let's say 0 to 2 is coming inside one group, then 3 to 5 is coming inside one group. So something like this. That's the idea that I'm going to do. You will be able to understand this while I'm while I will be helping you visualize after the end of random under the sampling has been done. But right now, if you are not able to understand this kind of steps, please do bear with me. I will be showing you what exactly I am doing. So I am again using my lambda function with map on the ships column in the train data frame. And I am saying that in all the rows of the ships, if the value of the ship, whatever it is, I will simply add one to it and perform flow division on it. And at max, I should get seven groups out of it. So if I run this thing and see the amount of data that I have gathered after this task. So we can see that we have created a total of eight different groups. Okay, There are a total of eight different groups that we have created. And in the first group, we are having this much amount of data in the first group. Sorry, this is the second group. In the second group, we are having this much amount of data in the same way till the eighth group. This is the amount of data that we are having. And then I am going to perform my random under sampling on this data. So a very basic idea between head n and sample n in pandas data frame is head gives me top n values of the data whereas data frame dot sample n returns the random n values from the data. So just to visualize what I am talking about if I go ahead and create train df dot head over here I am saying top 10 data values but now if I use train df dot sample 10 it is going to throw any 10 random samples in this data. So if I just run this cell again, you will see that I started from 140935. This number will simply change because it's a completely random. So it's completely random, right? Now I'm going to use this dot sample in my function in order to perform random under sampling. So let us just simply go ahead and visualize this function. And now we are having two different input arguments for this function. One is used for the data frame we want to apply this function on. And second is basically the random sample value that we are going to take from this data frame. So what I'll do is in the train data frame, this NDF is going to be basically my train data frame because that's where I'm going to perform my under sampling in this case right now. So if my data frame contains ship column and in that ship column, if the value is zero, then I am going to take all such samples. How many samples I am going to take 1500 because that's the base value that I have taken. So I'll be taking 1500 samples, but then I'm also doing the flow division with three. So I'm strongly under sampling all the ship counts with the values of zero or else if it's not zero, if it's some other number, then I'm not doing this high under sampling. I'm simply saying that I want to take only random samples of 1500 data points and that's how I'm going to under sample this whole idea. So in each groups now we were really having random random values over here right. So now what will happen to this? So it's going to become 1500 divided by 3. So that is going to become 500. So there will be only 500 data inside this 0. Then for 1, it will be 1500. Then again, everything apart from 0 will all be changed to 1500. So if I just want to show you how this under sampling is going to work, I'll run this cell. And then this is my balance train DF that I'm creating. And then I'm saying that I want to group by this group ship counts and apply this function on it. And then if I run this, we can see that all the groups apart from zero is changed to total of 1500 data. It is containing only 1500 data 
and then for zero it is containing only 500 data now what is the reason why did we under sample zero by a lot because even few images with no ships will be enough for our model to understand that okay this particular image is not having any ships so i don't really want large amount of images with no ships and that's why i'm just decreasing this number by even more amount and then now just remember these are not the ship counts these are the group ship counts so in this particular group there are multiple ship counts let's say one two three and then in that second group there are again more particular ships inside this group let's say three four five i'm going to help you visualize this but this is the group ship counts these are not the counts of the ships it's the grouped ship counts. so total of i guess 15 ships were there 15 counts were there let me check yes so zero ships till all the way till 15 ships so there are total of in one image the maximum amount of ships we can get is 15 so over here the seven is not saying that i am now going to represent only seven ships but now i am saying that all the values in between 1 to 15 has been stored inside these groups in this zero it's only zero group okay i'll show you what i'm trying to say over here so i'll run this cell and now you can see that the data frame for group ship count of zero i am having only 500 samples and it is containing ships with values only zero so it basically means that i am containing in the balanced data frame the images with no ships there are only 500 such datas then in the group ship count of one there are two different ship counts images with only one ships and images with two ships and now the total count of these two will add up to 1500 similarly for group three two three four five all the way till group seven we will be able to see that we have split these groups with let's say over here we started with zero now this is one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve in the last one there will be three yes fourteen fifteen and thirteen so thirteen fourteen fifteen and now all of this ship counts that we are having the total in this such groups will be 1500 so that's how we have done the under sampling and why is it random because we had chosen dot sample a dot sample is going to simply take random samples from the data frame and we chose 1500 again you can go ahead and play with this number but that's the main idea that we had performed over here so the under sampling has been done so now let's see how our data is going to look like after performing this under sampling so now this is before balancing this was the count of the ships it was having and now after balancing this is the count that i am having and now that this under sampling has been done we can go ahead and create the sets of or the batches of the training and the validation set for our model but before that we'll be needing some of the parameters for this so what i'll do over here is i'll simply go ahead and create this coding block and document all the parameters that i'll be needing henceforth in this notebook so now this is for the simplicity that there will be some task for you to do at the end out of which there is one task that you will be playing with this parameter so you should know exactly where to come in this whole notebook to play around with this number so i'll document it all in this particular coding block so if you want to just play around with this kind of things you can go ahead and change these numbers and see what is the overall output at the end depending on how you are changing these things the output will change but we are going to choose this kind of particular parameters right now in order to continue our video so half of the things that i have written over here will be useful in building up the model for the unit and some of the things i'll be using right away in the function that i'll be creating in order to generate the training and the validation batches so there will be some things that you will not be able to understand over here as of now but it will start making sense once i'll be explaining the purpose of layers inside the unit architecture but right now let us just continue with the parameters i'll quickly go through it so these are the batch size i'll be using in my training samples then edge crop is something i'll be using inside my model while using my cropping 2d layer then this is the number of epochs the epochs that i'll be using while training this is gaussian noise parameter is the thing that we'll be using inside the gaussian layer that is again a part of the layer uh, inside our model then up sampling mode is again something that is going to deal with the model part where i am going to choose the up sampling method as either up sampling 2d or on 2d transpose 
So as I mentioned, if you're not aware about the unit architecture, this kind of terms are just going to confuse you. Don't worry, while building up the model, I'll be going through the layers that we are going to use in that unit. And then what is the purpose of that particular layer? So I'll be going into it. So don't worry about it if you're not understanding as of now. Then this net scaling. This net scaling is again going to be a parameter that will be useful in our model. And this image scaling is some parameter that I'll be using right away in the next function that I'll be creating where I am saying that, do I need to downsample my image over here or no? So if it is one, it's not really downsampling anything. It's creating my image as it is. It's not going to downsample it. But let's say that if I'm changing this number to let's say two comma two. So it will skip all the alternate pixels in my image and downsample it in that particular way. But right now I'm not even trying to perform such kind of things. So I'll keep image scaling as one comma one. And then this is my batch size for the validation set. And then this is the steps per epoch that I'll be using in my training. And the basic idea that you can use over here is you check the length of the training data and divide it with the batch size that you are using. And then you'll be coming up with this particular number. And you can just play around with this number. I'm just choosing right now as it has 200. So we are done initializing the parameters. Now, any changes that you will be making in the parameters for the task that you have at the end of the video, you will just simply come to this block and change the respective things depending on the ideas that you are having. So now let us go ahead and create the function that I'm talking about. So in this particular code cell, all this kind of code, all this kind of code, we have already looked into the above code cells. So this is not really going to be a difficult thing if you go across this coding cell, but quickly just for you to understand what we are doing over here, I'll just go through it. The one thing that we are using over here is we are not saying written something. I'm saying yield out something for me. So this yield is simply going to create a generator for me in the Python and I can access any kind of batches that I'll be creating with the help of next that I'm having in my Python. So you will be understanding this is basically slightly different than the normal function because in normal functions we return out the values. Over here I'm returning the generator and how I'll be accessing it. I'll be using next in order to just go through all the samples that I have created in the batches. So I'm starting by creating all batches. So in the training data or the validation data, whatever is the data frame that I'm choosing, I'm simply going ahead and grouping the columns with the help of image ID. So I'm just going to group all the things together in that particular data frame and I'm creating a list out of it. So this list is going to contain the image ID as well as the mask that I'll be using. So all the batches is simply referring to total number of image IDs and the respective run length encoded pixels that I'm having in that particular data frame, I'm just going to list it in the all batches. And then I'm creating an empty list for the image and for the mask. And then I am saying that I want to go through all the samples in my this all batches. And then until I'm exhausting everything, I want to perform this many steps. So what are the steps? I am first of all shuffling my data in this all batches. So shuffling is going to just add a randomness in my data. And then I'm saying that for the image ID and the mask in all batches data that we have created in a list, I'll be getting my original path of the image with the help of OS path dot joint that we had also used earlier. So I am simply connecting my paths of the train image directory and the respective image ID. And then I am really simply going to create an image array with that particular path. And for mask, we have already created a function mask edge image. So in this mask as image is simply going to convert all the RLE into an image. So for a particular image ID, we are having respective RLE mask. And then by using this function that we had created earlier in this video, we are just clubbing them together. We are decoding it clubbing them together and creating a whole mask for that respective training image. So that's what I'm doing in the C mask. And then I'm simply appending the values that I'm getting for C image and the C mask into the respective list. And then if the length of any of this list is exceeding the batch size, I am simply yielding out the final images and the mask of the batches that I have created. And for the image, I'm using my I'm just scaling my image and I'm changing all the pixel values in between zero to one. And for 
the mask i am simply taking it out okay so this yield is basically going to create a generator for me and it's going to generate two different things one that is the image and the other thing that is the mask but image is now scaled in between 0 to 1 and then after this i'm just saying that again i want to empty this list so that i'll create another batch and this is how this process is going to repeat itself until i'm exhausting all the data i'm having inside that particular data frame either the training set or the validation set so that was all idea about this make image generator and now i'll be how i'll be accessing this thing with the help of next that i mentioned earlier so now let us just go ahead and perform this thing so i am generating my training data with the help of the function that i've just created so the batch size there was already four that we had created in this parameters so using that batch size of four i'm going to generate my training data so it's going to go through all the balance train df that we had created and i'm going to group by it with the help of image id and then i'm simply performing all of these steps onto the data that i'm having and i'm converting my final train generator with the train x and train y so this train x is containing all the images that is scaled in between 0 to 1 and train y is containing all the values of the mask this np stack is basically stacking up them together and now just to see the summary of one particular data out of this so this next is going to give me the first item inside this training generator and then again if i click on this next it will give me an another set of the train x and train y the another batch basically so if i just go ahead and run this thing i am having this train x as having the shape of 4 4 is basically the batch and then the image size so the image size is basically 768 768 and 3 and for mask it is 768 768 and 1 and over here also we are having 4 batch over here all right so this is the training sample and we are saying that the minimum value over here and the maximum value over here after scaling down the image is in between 0 to 1 and training was either 0 and 1 so it's not even changing it the minimum value will be 0 and the maximum value will be 1 so now if i just go ahead and i want to visualize this thing i simply just go ahead and run this code cell and now i'll just wait for the output and then based on that output i'll just explain this code so all this line after this particular thing we have already used this in the above code cells where it's just used for getting the subplots with the different headings or the titles of the different plots that we are creating and this is the subtitle that we are using so i'll not be really going into this code i'll only explain the first few lines the first four lines so if you remember earlier while starting the video we had imported some of the libraries and for the image processing part we had imported montage as well as the mark boundaries so that's where we are using in this particular code cell we are going to use the idea of this montage and the mark boundaries so what we are doing if you can see clearly we are having a montage effect over here where we have stitched different images together inside one image over here also we have stitched the segmentations inside this one image and then for the bounding boxes around the ships again we are doing the same exact thing creating a montage and then creating boundaries around the ships and that's the final image so how are we even getting this what's the idea what's the logic behind this code so this montage for the first images so let us first understand like you know what are these four images before going into this code so these four images are nothing but the output of the train x that we are getting from this train generator that we had created so from this train generator by using this next i am getting the first sample of four batches so there are four different images and in y i'm having its respective segmented masks and now there is one thing that i really wanted to point over here is while you will be going through this code there will be sometimes that only few of the ships will have this kind of segmentations not everyone will be segmented and now it will be depending on the rle data that we were having initially so if for a particular image if a particular ship is not given in the rle format then we cannot create segmentations for that particular ship but this is just an overall idea that i wanted to give that i had observed while going through this code so yeah that's all about it but coming back to this code what i'm saying is i want to first of all for this images for the training original images i want to create a montage of rgb and rgb consists of three different channels so in this montage i'm going through see this x dot shape what is this x 
I am using my lambda function with the input as x, the parameter that I'm using as x. Now what is this x? Now because I'm creating this montage RGB and then I'm passing it on train x, this x is nothing but this train x. So this x dot shape of 3 is nothing but x dot train x dot shape of 3. So in this train x shape, on the third entry, we are having the value of the channels. So there are a total of three different channels. So this range 3 is going to give me numbers 0, 1 and 2, which is representing red, blue and green channels of an image. So this montage RGB, I am stacking all of these channels together inside an array by using this montage. So I am taking all these four images with the size 760 and 768 and then for the red channel, for the blue channel and for the green channel, I am just stacking up all together to create a montage of RGB. And then this batch RGB is nothing but the training batch that we had created and it's just one example. Just know that this next is going to give me only one example of the batch that we have created of four different image. And that's what exactly has been displayed over here. In the RGB, I am using my three different channels, I am stacking this together and then I am displaying it. How am I displaying it? With the same functions that we had already used, that is I am show and then subtitle and all these things are very much similar, so I am not even going to discuss about it. So yeah, that is all about the RGB image that we have generated. And for the segmentations, we know that we are having the Y data, so train wise creating the images of segmented versions. So now over here, there is only need of one channel that is the zero that we are giving we don't need any multiple channels and that's why we are getting all these things either the pixels are zero or it's one so zero is for the background and one is for the shape so that's my segmented montage and then this batch overlap this is where we are using mark boundary so what is this mark boundary is doing so i am taking the overlap of both of this image and i'm removing all these backgrounds of zero and replacing it with the respective RGB that I'm having over here in the original image and then on the shape on the shape I am just cutting all the part that has been filled in the middle of the ship and I'm just keeping the boundaries in the overlap so that's how I'm getting finally the bounding boxes around this ships by using this mark boundaries idea okay so that's a very basic idea that we have performed over here now this was all about like we have created the training samples of batch size 4 but now we are going to also create validation set validation batch and in order to do this I am again going to use exact same idea I am using my generator function I am trying to create the image generators for the validation data set and therefore I am using my validation data frame and this is the batch size that I am going to pass that is the parameter that we had already set and it was the value was 400 if I am not wrong let me check Yes, this is the 400. You can go ahead and just play around with this number, but yes, because it's 400, it's going to take some time to run, but let's see. It's going to give me the same output, basically, as I had got over here, because everything is same. It's just that I'm having it for the validation. So in the validation, again, I'm going to have the same shape. And because in the main, this function that we had created, it was yielding me this train x with the scaled output. So the scale is going to convert all the values in between 0 to 1. And for train y or the validation y, I know that in the segmented versions, the outputs or the pixels that I'm having is only 0 and 1. And therefore, the minimum will be 0 and the maximum will be 1. So as we had expected, see, but now the only one thing that has changed is from 4 to 400 because now we are using the batch size for the validation image is 400, not 4. So only that 4 is going to change. Everything apart from that is going to stay as it is. So now we have also created the validation data set. And now we are done splitting our data in a way that our model is going to understand. But there is one more step before we actually proceed in order to build our model. And that is the image augmentation. So augmentation basically does some kind of operations in all this image. It tries to like, you know, flip some images. It creates some kind of rotations in the images, decrease brightness and all this kind of stuff keep on happening. So out of which we are going to perform some of it just so that we are having enough samples for our model to understand. Even if you don't do this step, okay, if, you, if you're just skipping this step entirely, it's still not going to matter that much because we are having a lot of data already. So you can skip this part if you want, but just for the completeness of this notebook, 
as this notebook is highly inspired from the work of K. Scott and team. I am simply going ahead and explaining everything mentioned over there in as simple way as possible. So because for the completeness as I mentioned, it is necessary to show you what are the augmentation that has been done. So now if you want, you can still go ahead and play around with this. As I mentioned, you can either completely remove this and see what is happening or you can just add a couple of more augmentation techniques and see what is the output that we are getting. But the basic idea is to just play around and see what is the output. But let's just get back to this particular coding cell. So what exactly are we doing over here? So we are importing image data generator from keras.preprocessing.image. So now this image data generator is a really a powerful tool in order to augment our image data in such a way that it's going to perform in real time. So while training, I'll be able to augment my data. So it's really a powerful tool. But now this is not the only one tool to augment our data. There are multiple other ways also. But yeah, for this particular project, we are using this image data generator. Now, what are the kind of augmentations that I want to perform on my images? So I am choosing only three. Well, there are a lot of other augmentations that we can perform. So first, I'll, let's just discuss about what are the augmentations that we are doing. So we are doing a random rotation in between 0 to 15 degrees for any given image. And then we're also performing flips on the image, either horizontal or vertical. And all of this is going to happen at random. And then the data format I'm choosing is at channels underscore last. Why? Because I know that the data that I'm having is in this particular format, that I'm having my batch, then height, then width, and then the channels. Channels is at last. And therefore, I'm saying that the data format that I'm having is channels underscore last. If this channels was first, the batch size was at the last, in that case, channels underscore first is what I would have chosen for the data format. So now these are the things that I have chosen for my image data generator. But as I mentioned, there are a lot of multiple other augmentations that you can perform. You can surely go ahead and try some of this as well. But for now, just for the demonstration purpose, I'm choosing only three. I can also just close this. So I'll just run this code cell. And now what I'll do is I'll simply create this augmentation data. So basically these are the arguments that I'm going to pass in the image data generator for the training images as well as the mask for the training. So what I'm trying to say is over here I'm creating my image data generator with the help of the keyword argument that we had created over here. I'm simply passing inside this image data generator and then I'm creating my image and the label generator. And this is what I'm going to use inside this create augmentation generator function. So this function, what is it going to do? It's going to take one of the generators inside it. So the generator that we are having is the train data generator. And the state value is going to just ensure that every time that we are performing this, the randomness is going to occur in the same way. So every time we are performing the same state value. So then we are saying that if the state value is not none, I want to choose any value in between like you know 0 to this many nines that we are having. So it's going to get any kind of such values but I'm going to assign this later on you will see I'm going to assign this value as 42. And then in order to augment my data in my training images as well as the training labels I want to perform my augmentations exactly same. Therefore even for that I need the same seed values. So what I'm doing over here is this image gen image underscore gen dot flow and the label underscore gen dot flow this is basically allowing me to create batches of augmented images and then I am simply going to pass this on my train data and then I am going to generate my overall augmentation. So now this is just used in order to create my batches in the augmented data but for this x values that is the original images I am just performing the reverse scaling. So the images that I was converting into 0 to 1, between 0 to 1, the pixel values are now again changed back in the original format for creating the augmented version. So yeah, that's the one thing that we are doing over here. But while yielding it out, I'm again performing this scaled version over here. So now this is going to be my actual train images and this is my actual train label. So that's the final thing that I'll be using before I pass it on to my model. So yeah, this is the basic idea that we are using and you can see that the seed value over here is the seed particular value. So now if this seed value is not same, we will not be able to perform the same kind of augmentation on the real images as well as the labels. I want exactly same augmentation happening in both of it and therefore I am 
going to have the same set value. Now, just quickly to summarize what we are doing in this particular function, we are passing in the train data generator, which gives us an output of two things, train x and train y. So, for every next next we are going to do, we are going to get respective train x and train y. So, for all this train x and train y in this train data generator, I want to create augmented batches. And now, for x and y both, I want to have same order of augmentation and therefore, I am having this seed value inside this inputs basically this I am passing this inputs inside this particular thing this flow is going to ensure that I am going to create batches of this augmentation and then this particular seed value is different from this seed value this seed value is going to ensure that every time I run this particular thing the randomness that I create in this function is always same it is not going to change them so therefore I am also going to fit a value over here but even if we do not fit it then like you know it is going to do it automatically with the help of this random choice it is going to just choose randomly a number in between 0 to all this kind of I guess there are four nines so yeah in between 0 to 9999 nine, it is going to choose a random set value but yeah I am not going to let it do it I am going to give my set value over here as 42 but yeah that is the overall thing that is going on it is going to give me the final train x and train y it is going to give me the generator for this augmented versions in batches for x and y. So now let me just go ahead and create the augmented train data with the help of the function that I have just created. I am passing in the train training generated data that we had created with the seed value of 42. And then now this is the actual train x and train y data. So if I just print the summary of this, let it run. So x and y is having this particular data that we had already seen and this is the minimum and the maximum value. And let us now visualize the final output after performing this image augmentation with the help of image data generator. So in this particular code, everything is same. So I'll just quickly run this cell. And everything over here, as I mentioned, everything is same as we had done earlier to create this kind of plots. The only one thing that I'm changing is instead of passing in train X and train Y, I am passing T underscore X and T underscore Y. Everything is same. So montage RGB of TX is going to give me these images. And this uh, montage only with the TY is going to give me the masks. And for the bounding box, I am using again mark boundaries thing that we had used earlier. And it is going to give me the bounding boxes. And now the main task over here that I am going to do is after visualizing this whole idea, I am going to go ahead and create a new coding cell and show you what is the amount of garbage that I have created in this whole coding cells. So if I just go ahead and try to run this cell, let's see what is the amount of garbage that you, we have collected. So as we can see, it is 8699. And this value kind of seems weird because of like, you know, we may have run a, a particular cell for a lot of times while I'm recording this video because of which we're getting a lot of garbage over here. But what I'll do is I'll simply uh, rerun the whole notebook and then let you know what is the final amount of garbage that we have created after running it only once. I am not going to rerun anything and then let us see what is the amount of garbage that we have collected. And I will simply just pause this video over here and come back after I have done the final run and I will uh, just show you. So I will simply just restart and clear this and run everything. Pause this video over here and I will just see you in a while. As discussed we can see that the amount of garbage now collected has decreased by a lot of amount. The only basic reason behind this is as I had mentioned that initially while I was recording the video, I was keep on rerunning a lot of coding cells inside this notebook because of which the amount of garbage that I was collected was pretty much high. And now after restarting the whole notebook and then running everything at once, now we can see the amount of garbage has significantly reduced. And now this was just done for the purpose of showing you how this gc.collect is working. But now if you ask me a question that was it even necessary to restart our whole notebook, the answer is no because that is the whole purpose of gc.collect. It will collect all the kind of garbages that your code is going to create no matter if it is 85, 1000, 10,000, a million. It will collect every garbage that you have collected, I mean your code has created. It will collect everything and then simply block it all for you and create some new space for you. And that is how we are going to manage our memory with the help of garbage collections. And I hope now the idea has been cleared like how this thing is working just in case if you are not aware about it. But now we have successfully created the data that we directly need to now just feed into our model and just train that model and get the outputs.
but now that's all about it the main part of the project where we had to show you about the rla data and how these things work that is clear now about the model building where we are going to build the whole unit architecture let's say that it's the first time that you are hearing about this architecture then the very basic idea is that we use this architecture in image segmentation so the task that we are doing right now as i mentioned earlier is image segmentation and that's the main reason why have i chosen over here the unit architecture and let's say that if you're a complete beginner if you're not having any of such idea about like you know what is a convolution neural network or a unit architecture no matter that like you know i'm going to explain everything very quickly in this particular video because now see this is not the main part that we are focusing in this project the main part is already covered now it's simply model building preparing callbacks and just training the data and this is pretty pretty much same in any kind of deep learning model so we are not going to stress about this in a particular in this particular project but let's say that if you are interested in learning about this then what you can do is if you are a complete beginner then if you have enjoyed this kind of video and if you want to make this kind of projects of your own then what you do is as i had also mentioned this at the start of the video that is at spartivision we are also providing live training programs where teachers or the instructors from iits top nits are going to instruct you and there is one specific training program that is much related to the task that we are doing right now and that is the unit architecture doing image segmentation with the help of unit architecture so it's the program of 2 months it's totally going to focus everything from scratch all the way up to the advanced levels of the things that we are doing right now and even more advanced than this over there you will be using segmentation models as well after getting the idea about what is the unit architecture we'll directly go ahead and up implement these segmented models image segmented models but that's again a complete different story if you are a beginner i would really recommend you to just check out the brochure of that training program and if it's interesting for you just go ahead and take that particular training program or let's say that if you are really interested for us in order to create a new project which is only focused much on unit architecture and the convolution neural networks then also do write that down in the comments below that yes Uh, we want to see a project where the explanation is focused totally based on unit and convolution neural networks from scratch so i'll also be trying to prepare this kind of videos for you but let's if that's not the case if you are having a very good idea about what is a convolution neural network and unit architecture this is going to be a quick revision for you guys and then we are just going to build up the model so first of all let us understand convolution neural network and then we can understand what is a unit architecture so i'll just scroll a bit uh, over here so the main idea about the convolution neural network is to decrease the overall output size and increase the amount of features and the convolutional 2d transpose or the upsampling 2d the function of this is to increase the image size and either perform convolution inside it or not perform the convolution inside it now what is the idea behind the convolution so this is called my filter this is my input image that i am getting and if i implement my this filter on this image and just simply slide my kernels to the right by one one units then this is the output i will be getting how so if i'm placing my this kernel over here so one 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 is over here so after performing this whole idea over here of the convolution it's going to give me the output of 4 so 1 times 1 is 1 this 1 times 1 is 1 everywhere there is 1 1 1 so it will be at the end 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 that is 4 and then if i move this filter over here and over here and over here because everywhere there is only 1 the output will be 4 4 4 4 and now the interesting thing to look over here is that the image size has decreased from 3 3 to 2 2 we can also keep the image size same if you want by adding a padding layer but again for that you will have to uh, i have a very basic idea about like you know how convolution neural network works so if we just add a padding layer over here it will just have the same output even after the convolution 2d but if we don't have the padding then this is the amount of output that we are going to get and then what about the convolution 2d transpose as i mentioned it will increase the shape by decreasing the amount of features again because that's how we want the segmented mass as an output right the image segmented version is what we want as an output so the amount of features will be less it should only have one in this particular case so how this deconvolutional or convolutional 2d transpose is working over here so con 2d transpose is basically taking a padding layer over here 
and then implementing this convolutional 2D transpose filter onto it. So now just imagine there is a like you know a layer of zero, a padding layer of zeros outside this one 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 one. And now if I am implementing this con 2D transpose onto it, so over here there are three zeros and then there is this one. So convolution of this three ones with the zeros, the output will be zero. But then the convolution of this one with this one, the answer will be one. Similarly, now if I'm having a stride of one or basically the shift of one, now the this particular filter is moved over here. So now there are two zeros on top of ones and two bottom ones we are having. And now if you are performing this convolution, the zeros with this ones, the output is zero. But now this ones and this ones together, the convolution output will be two. And let's say now by doing this, we are coming in the center. After going through this, there is one more layer over here. And then after next thread, we will be coming over here. Sorry, over here, where I'll be having only these two things. Then there are two zeros over here. So that two zeros with this ones will not give any output. But these two ones and these two ones will convert together and give an output of two. And then if I'm having my filter exactly onto the image without any kind of padding layers, exactly on this. So again, we are going to get the output of four. So now that's the main idea about this convolution 2D and convolution 2D transpose. There is also one more way of upscaling the image that is upsampling 2D. Over there, we are again increasing the image size and decreasing the amount of features, but we are not performing any kind of convolutions. It's just increasing. We are just adding extra padding layers across it, but it's not going to change any kind of things. Okay. So that's one thing that we have to know about it. Now, what about max pooling and average pooling? So let's say that this is my image and onto which I'm applying, implementing my two by two filter. So the max pooling is basically going to pull out the maximum number out of this four. So that is hundred over here. The maximum number is 184. That's why I'm getting 184. Similarly for these two blocks. Now, what is the average pooling? We are pulling out the average of these four numbers and writing it over here. Average of these four numbers, writing it over here, average of this 12, 12, 12, 12 is just 12. That's how I'm writing it over here. So now that's the idea about max pooling and the average pooling layers. Now these are the maximum layers that we should be knowing before we understand the unit architecture. Again, I've gone through this very quickly. If you're not understanding anything at least like, you know, what we can do or at most what we can do, not at least, but at most what we can do is just type down your questions in the comments and we'll be trying to get to you as soon as possible and help you sort out any kind of questions if you're having. So let us now take a quick walkthrough over the unit architecture and answer some of the questions that you might have right now in your head regarding like why are we even choosing this architecture for this particular task or how are you going to implement the ideas of the layers that we just talked about the convolution layer, max pooling layer, upsampling, etc, etc. So let me first start by answering that why we are choosing unit and then I'll help you build the intuition behind why are we even learning about this layers and how are we going to implement it in the building of the whole unit architecture. So this unit architecture is proven to work like a charm whenever it comes to the image segmentation task. And now that in this project, we are also dealing with an image segmentations, then why don't we just try it for ourselves and see if it's going to work in, in a better way or not. So that's the whole idea about why we are choosing the unit because it has been giving wonderful results for a lot of different image segmentations on different data set. So we are just going to try and see if it's also going to give such wonderful results for our data. And now the layers that we just learned about are the ones that are usually found inside the convolutional neural network, which is also abbreviated as CNN. So whenever we see the names of layers like convolution, max pooling, etc., we are simply referring to the networks that are CNN and unit is also built with these layers and hence it is also a CNN. And that's why we learned about these ideas of the convolution, max pooling, etc., in order to build the whole unit with this kind of layers. So how does this kind of network learns about the features from an image? So in the beginning, the weights of this or the parameters of this convolution filters that we dealt with earlier over here are assigned some random values. Initially it is just assigned some random values. And now during the process of training, epoch by epoch, these values are slowly modified to the optimal values that recognize the features of this image. So just to give you a rough idea, this unit is going to take the original RGB format input that we are having in the train X image 
and give out a respective segmented version as an output at the end of this net network and then it is simply going to compare it with the original mask that we have generated using the RLE data in the earlier part of this video. And then we are simply going to use some metric and optimization technique which will find the optimal values of this filters parameters that will minimize the overall loss function that we are going to select for our model to for the training purpose. And for our task we are going to choose the dice coefficient as our matrix and dice loss with the binary cross entropy also that is known as the combo loss as the loss function that we are going to minimize while training. So we'll be taking a look about this in a while after we are done building our whole model. But for now, let us quickly understand the whole idea of this U shape that we are having in the unit architecture. What is this whole thing symbolizing or what is it indicating? So if you are not at all getting the things that I'm explaining right now over here, I would highly recommend that there is a link given uh, over here. You simply go ahead and look about the unit architecture. And if you find this kind of things interesting, and if you want to implement these ideas onto some different cool projects, I had earlier shown you that at Spartificial, we are having a specific program that is focused on units and the convolution neural networks where we teach everything from scratch. It's about two hours of, I mean, two months of whole program. And then if you perform well, then you get even more benefits of it by performing or taking part into the research internship and much more things that we offer at Spartificial. So if you are interested about this implementation of this unit onto the lunar exploration, then you can again, as I mentioned, explore this brochure of the lunar exploration that is about to start in some time. You will simply go ahead and enroll yourself into that program and then you can just see if you are able to implement the whole idea behind the task. But right now, if you really want to get a quick idea and if you're not able to get anything from this video, I would highly recommend that you go through this blog and try to make your ideas first clear and then come back to this video and try to complete it. So this architecture basically contains two main paths. The first path is called the encoder that is shown in the left, which is basically used to capture the features of the image. And it is just done with the help of the blocks of multiple convolution layers along with the max pooling layers. And the other part that is we can see on the right is called the decoder, which is used to enable the precise location used with the help of uh, transpose convolutions or the upsampling. And in the whole of this unit architecture, we cannot see any kind of dense layers. And hence, this is the end to end fully convolutional neural network. But now if we just talk about the ideas of the encoder and decoder specifically, then encoder in the encoder part, the size of the image, as you can see, is gradually reducing while increasing the depth of the images. And this is going to basically help our network learn that what information is to be captured over here. But at the same time, it is losing the information about the localization, like where exactly is the information. So for that, we are having the decoder part that we can see on the right hand side. So we are simply implementing the transposed convolutions along with the regular convolutions over here. So over here, the size of the image is gradually increasing while decreasing the depth. So over here, we are going to understand this idea of where exactly the information is located. And we are just going to get this idea with the help of implementing the upsampling techniques either the upsampling 2D layer or the convolution 2D transpose layer. Now to get a better precise locations at every step of this decoder, we use something called as a skip connection by concatenating the output of the transpose convolution layer with the feature maps from the encoder at the same level in the decoder. So as we can see, these kind of gray arrows are representing the same idea of the skip connection. So this is just done to even locate our particular features where it is in a better way. And after every concatenation, we again apply two consecutive convolutions so that model can learn to assemble more precise output. And this is all about the unit. This is the whole function that unit does. And now let us look into the numbers that are mentioned on this diagram. What are these numbers? Let us dig deep into this and note that these are the numbers that was used in the original paper. We are going to use slightly different approach for our work for our particular project. But just to give you a basic idea of how this thing work. 
we are going to implement the same idea in our case as well by just simply changing few things here and there that I'll be explaining while taking the walkthrough of the model that we are going to build. So before we understand how this encoder decreases the size of the feature maps while increasing the depths or for the decoder part, how does the output size after every upsampling increases while decreasing the overall depths? We first need to know how each layer calculates the output size using the input size, kernel size, padding and strides. So this is the formula we are going to use to understand the whole idea about the output size. So in the above example that we have considered in the convolutional 2D layer, we use the strides of 1 as we are shifting our kernel by 1, 1 boxes and then the padding was 0. Over here we didn't have any kind of extra padding layer. Along with that, we can see that the input size of this image is 3 and this kernel size is 2. Then with this formula shown that that is this is the input size, this is the kernel size, this is the uh, amount of padding, this is the stride value. And by using this substitution of these values that we have created into this formula, so the input size is 3, so 3 plus because 0 padding is there, so 2 times 0 minus because the kernel size is 2 and then divide the whole thing by strides that is 1 and now add all of these things to 1 the final output that we are going to get is after doing this 3 plus 2 times 0 minus 2 divided by 1 plus 1 will be coming out to be 2 hence because the overall shape is a square shape it's 3 cross 3 matrix then the output is also going to become 2 cross 2 matrix so uh, here we can see that we have got the 2 cross 2 as the output size of the feature map. So that's exactly how we are going to decrease the amount of size that we are having for the particular feature map. Now, if we do the same idea for the con 2D transpose, what do we have? So here we have strides again of 1, padding size is now of 1 and filter or the kernel size is of 2 along with the original size of the image as 2. Hence, here we get the output size by using all this information with the input size as 2, padding of 1, then the kernel size of 2, strides of 1. So by filling this all information, it will be 2 plus 2 times 1 minus 2 divided by 1 and adding everything to 1, the answer will be 3. So here we got the output size as 3 cross 3 or the output shape as 3 cross 3. So we can see that how convolution 2D transpose is helping us increase the image size. But now what about the max pooling layer and the upsampling 2D layer? What happens over there? So let us quickly look into this part as well. So here we have input size of 4, kernel size of 2, 0 padding and strides by default in max pooling is set to 2. So what will be the output shape over here? It will be 4 plus 2 times 0 minus 2 and now because the strides are 2 I'll divide this whole value by 2 and then add 1 to it the overall output is 2 and hence the output shape of this max pooling is directly halved by the original value so original value was 4 by 4 but the feature map that I am getting after the max pooling with this stride value of 2 and the kernel size is 2 I am getting my output of this feature map exactly half as compared to the original one that is 2 cross 2 at the end. So just opposite to this upsampling is just going to double the image size if the configuration is same that if I'm using the 2 cross 2 kernel size with the strides of 2 I'll be doubling the image over there. So we'll be seeing about this in the example that we'll be doing while taking a look into the upsampling part. So along with this there is one more thing we should know over here in the Keras padding is by default set to same which means that your image will be padded such that the overall feature map retains the actual shape as the input while we are having this option to set padding to zero by choosing the option of valid padding instead of the same padding in order to just skip this effect of pad padding so in this given example over here they have used the strides of one with a valid padding and kernel size of three for convolution layers and for the pooling layers they have used the strides of two with a filter size of 2. So by using this whole idea, we can see that exactly after each convolution, the shape is decreasing in a particular fashion. And then after max pooling, over here we can see that it's directly being halved. 
At the same time, notice that the depth is also increasing as we are using more and more kernels to learn these features as we go deep down into this CNN. So for example, in this particular image, if we take the first blue box over here, the input shape is 7, 572. The strides, as I mentioned, is 1, padding is 0 because we choose valid padding and the filter size is taken over here as 3. So now if I calculate the output with all these things, I am having the input as 572. So 572 plus 2 times 0 padding minus the kernel size that is 3 divide it by the stride value of 1 and add everything this to 1, the output is 570. So the next convolution will again have the same effect. So again the size of the next feature map is just going to decrease by 2. So the output will be 568 by 568. Finally then applying this max pooling with the kernel size of 2 and the strides we are using is of 2, we can exactly see that from 568 the image has been halved. And in each layer, we are using more kernels and hence the depth is increasing as we go deep in the network, starting from this depth from 1, then to 64, all the way down till 1024. But now in our case, what we are going to do is, we are going to have padding set to same in the, for the convolution layers and stride as 1 with the filter size of 3. And for the pooling layers, it will have the strides of 2 and the kernel size of 2. So therefore, in our case, the feature map won't be reducing the overall size. Why? Because we are using the same padding and same padding ensures that the output shape is retained. At the same time, we are also increasing the depth and then for the max pooling layer, it will pull out almost the promising features, the most promising features of the image and reduce the size again to half of the input received to that particular layer. Again, the idea of increasing the depth is done by adding more filters as we can see uh, in this coding that we are continuously adding more and more amount of filters over here. This is also seen in the summary part. In the summary over here, we can see that we started with 768, 768, 3. Then after two convocation layers, the depth has been increased to 8 because these are the number of filters that we are using. But the size is still 768, 768. However, after max pooling, this value is again halved by using the same amount of feature size or the number of kernel that is written and but the shape has been decreased to the half. So from 768 to 768 it has been reduced to 384 to 384. So this is what we can see this pattern is just going to repeat as it is in the whole encoding part as we can see in the summary. Similarly now we are also having the decoding part. So what is happening in the decoding part? Here up sampling is going to just double the output size in both of our cases, the one that is shown in this original example and also in our case. Then the concatenation part is going to take the features from the respective encoding part and simply add it to this particular decoding block. Also as we are using the padding as same, in our case the size of the feature map will be retained whereas in the given example over here we can see that after the convolution layers the size is reducing again by the amount of 2 with the same logic that we did with the earlier part in the encoding part. So let us now directly look into our summary and try to understand what is going on for this decoding part. So after this fifth block, after this fifth block the upsampling is starting and hence here we can see that the size of the feature map has been doubled and then the fourth encoder block features are added to the sixth block. That is the first block. The sixth block over here is basically the first block of the decoding part. Using the help of this concatenation, we are just adding this fourth block encoded features, encoder features into the sixth block over here. So hence what I'm trying to say over here is the output after the concatenation has the same shape but the features are added of the fourth block to the sixth block so now features the total features now i am having over here is 128 plus the 64 and now this becomes 192 so now the shape is changing from this 48 48 128 and it will go to because i'm doubling the shape it will be 96 96 and now because i'm also adding the part of 64 from the fourth block to this 128 the amount of features now I'm having is 192. So I am over here increasing the depth, but now after the convolution layers, again, the depth will decrease. And then after again doing the upsampling part, again, there'll be a rise over there. But the overall things you will see, this 
features over here or the depth of the feature map is simply going to decrease. This is the pattern that we can observe over here in the summary. So in all the subsequent layers, as we can just see this effect is just similar until the final segmented output has been achieved of the shape 768 by 768 by one. And that's what we, all, we were looking after. And just note that this part here is focusing on choosing what kind of upsampling is to be done. The earlier part that we can see over here. We did not discuss about the earlier part, right? We directly jump onto the how the unit is going to work. But what about the uh, other things that I'm using over here? How did I use the upsampling 2D layer over there? How could I use the convolution 2D transpose layer in the whole unit architecture? So that's what I'm trying to explain over here. So over here, it is the simple upsampling 2D or the convolution 2D transpose. So while setting the parameters over here, in the earlier, we kept this upsampling part over here as simple. If we had chosen decon over here, I would have chosen simply the convolution 2D transpose layer as compared to the upsampling 2D layer that has been now considered because over here I am saying that if I am using this upsampling as uh, decon, then give me the upsampling done with the help of con 2D transpose layer, else give me the upsampling with the upsampling 2D layer. And that's the main reason why did we choose this upsampling 2D. You can obviously go in and try to change this to decon in the parameters section where we had defined all the parameters. You can obviously go ahead and play with it. As I had also mentioned this earlier that we are going to just play with these things depending on what you want to see in the output. So over here you can, it's completely up to you. If you want, you change this to decon from the simple mode and it will simply activate this second function with the con 2D transpose layer. And then now comes the input shape and the average pooling is done with this kernel size as chosen in the parameters, else it should be set to none. So as you have set this already to none, the, this particular code is not going to be executed. And then comes the most important layers. Over here, these are the Gaussian noise to mitigate the overfitting and the batch normalization to allow us to use higher learning rate without actually affecting the gradients. And then at the end, we can see that we are using cropping only once in our particular project. Whereas in the original paper, as we can see over here, it was suggested to use after every concatenation, the cropping needs to be done. So over here, the, some of the edges are to be cropped over here. So in our particular use case, I'm not following this in all the layers. I'm doing this only for the last one. So what is happening over here? I'm again in the parameters, I have defined this value as 16. So I am cropping 16 and 16 from both the sides. So total of things that I'm cropping over here from my shape image shape is 32. So now from 768 to 768, my shape has changed to, if I take away 16, 16, it will be 736, 736. If I remove the total of 32, it will be 736, 736. And then again, to get the actual correct shape that we are needing that is 768, 768, one, we again need to get this particular shape. So how will we do it by just adding the zero padding layer over here. And that is again, we are going to use the same amount of side layers that we are going to add just like we remove, just like we cropped, we are going to add the same amount of numbers to get the 768 from 736. So again, we are using the same edge crop over here because it is taking the value of 16, the total will be 32. So the final output will again change to 768 from 736. And that's it. We are finally done building the whole unit architecture. And as I have been mentioning, if these things are feeling a bit overwhelming for you to understand, please go ahead and go to that link that I had mentioned earlier. And still, if you are interested to know more about it, you can surely go ahead and register into any kind of our programs that is dealing with this unit architectures. Also, but before we move ahead, I'll just show you one thing. That is over here, I am also creating my model by using the inputs and the outputs as my either it will be the layer of the zero padding or else it will be the one more up sampling. Now this is going to be none over here because I've set net, net scaling to be none or else this would be activated and like you know, it would be contributing to the final up sampling. But now it all depends up to the final layers that you are having over here. You adjust it accordingly. But now because I'm not needing it, I have kept the net scaling to none. And that's why this won't be executed. And my final output would be this particular layer. 
And one more thing that I would like to add is in order to connect all these kind of layers with each other, I am just saying that the previous layer is just going to be passed over here as the argument. Then again, this previous layer is going to be passed over here as the argument. I will keep on doing it until the last one. And you can also find this information over here that my input is going to be, uh, this Gaussian layer is going to be connected to the input. Then the batch normalization is connected to the previous layer. So all this kind of connection has been clearly seen over here. And all the parameters that our kernels are going to learn, all these parameters in each layer has been mentioned over here. So that's one thing that I wanted to mention before we go ahead into the building part of the coefficients or the matrix that we are going to use along with the loss. So over here for the matrix part and the loss part that we need in order to compile our this segmentation model that we have created earlier over here, the segmentation model that we have created for this if in order to compile this, we need to have some kind of matrix as well as the loss onto which we are going to minimize that loss function. So what we are going to use over here, as I had also mentioned it earlier, for matrix part, I am going to use the dice coefficient. It is really very much similar to the IOU score. So IOU score is nothing but the intersection over union. Like what is the intersection between the two images over the final? What is the summation of the both of the images? But over here, I'm doing the same thing, but I'm just having slight amount of modification over here. And then for the loss part, I am going to use this combo loss. So I'll be talking about it now. So what is the dice coefficient? In order to compile our model, we'll need some matrix and that matrix is dice coefficient that we are using for this part. Obviously, you can go ahead and try to compute some different things like uh, you can compute IOU score if you like, but dice coefficient is also going to work in the similar way. So what I am doing over here is this, what is this A and B? This A and B, you can just consider that A is the actual mass that I have created from the RLA data and B is the predicted mass that I'm getting from the model. And then in order to check the efficiency, what I'm doing is I'm simply finding what is the overlap region of these two images. And then I'm simply dividing it by the total of this. And then if I multiply this whole data by two, I'm going to get the dice coefficient over here. So now there is something absurd about this dice coefficient that we have computed over here. Now, if you notice what happens if my mask is containing no shapes at all. So if you remember, we only have two kind of pixels in my segmented output. One is for the background and one is for the shape. So for because there are only two, I'm using my activation in my final output as the sigmoid. Everywhere else you can see that I have just used the ReLU. That's the convention that we follow. But because there are only two uh, pixels that I have at the end, I'm using the sigmoid because it's used for the binary classification task. So now over here, only because I know that I am having the zero and one, I know that if there is no ship in my mask, then all of this is going to become zero, the top part and the bottom part, if it's just zero, zero, everything will be zero. So this, that's the absurd absurdity that we are going to get over here if it's zero over zero. So to avoid this, what we do is we add a smoothing factor over here of one, we add one smoothing. So that has been done over here. So this is the formula for the dice loss It's nothing but one minus the dice coefficient, but now it's the elegant way to compute the dice loss with the extra smoothing we are adding over here. This was just to represent, to display how this dice coefficient looks like. And this is just to give you the representation of it with the actual way of doing it. But we always add some kind of a smoothing and over here we are choosing the smoothing of one. So that was about the dice coefficient. Now, if we talk about the loss that we want to create over here is going to be the combo loss. Now, what is the combo loss? It's simply defined as the weighted sum of the dice loss dice loss is this and a modified cross entropy. Initially, we know that the, bias cross, the binary cross entropy looks like this, but the modified version is having the beta. Now, what is this beta is something that you have to research. I'm going to give you the value of the alpha over here, but what is this value of beta? Now you have to come up with that idea with the help of two documents that I've given over here. All the ideas of the semantic segmentation, what are the kind of losses that we can use has been written over here, out of which combo loss is one of the thing. And then more details about the combo loss has been given over here. So you just read these documents and try to get the idea of like, you know, how are you going to create this combo loss over here? What would be the best way for you to come up with that thing? So over here, if I just show you, I am showing how to compute the dice coefficient, but I am giving you this as your task that like you know, complete this question, this particular function, which is going to give us the loss that is combo loss. Basically, I am writing over here something you can just simply remove the something and write the actual function that you are having. And I am giving you to use alpha value as one e to the power of minus three. 
but what will be the value of beta that you're going to choose okay even if you want to change this e 1e minus 3 you can obviously go ahead and change it depending on the ideas that you learn over here because over here you can also find the information about the alpha and beta both so what is happening in the dice coefficient if you notice i'm using keras from not from but actually i'm importing my keras dot backend as k so over here i am doing for the intersection part i am just multiplying these two things and just flattening all these layers okay even this k sum is basically going to help me flatten my channels and give me the final one output and then for the union i am simply adding this for the intersection i am multiplying this and then simply implementing the dice coefficient and generating it now the question for you is to come up with the binary cross entropy loss along with the dice coefficient and write your function over here and then simply go ahead and compile your model over here and once you compile what's going to happen is we are going to choose adam optimizer uh, adam optimizer with the learning rate of 1e minus 4 and the dk of 1e minus 6 and i am simply going to give the input uh, over here as a dice loss that i'll be creating over here along with the matrix of the dice coefficient that we have created and after that i'm going to compile the model and then create callbacks now callbacks are really good for us in order to know when to stop our training automatically without us doing anything also like you know what how to change learning rate based on the outputs we are getting we want to change the learning rate so all these kind of things we do with the help of callbacks and a detailed idea about like you know how or what are the kind of callbacks we use you can find it over here you can just click on this link it will redirect you to this particular web page where we'll be able to find every callbacks that we want to see so right now let's see if you're using early stopping and if you want to know about what is early stopping if you're not aware about it you just click on this early stopping and uh, for some reason it's not showing me right now let me rerun it i guess there is some issue this, oh no it's not there is not nothing wrong i guess my internet is slow but yeah this early stopping is going to give you a great detail about like you know what is happening over here basically it is used to stop if my loss is not improving for a particular amount of epochs and i just simply want to stop my training i don't want to use any of my computing power after that point so there are a lot of multiple callbacks for this kind of things so model check mode is going to basically help me save the best weights i will be generating in this model and then reduce learning rate is basically going to reduce my learning rate in a specific way i'm decreasing the factor of 0.5 after every time I want to change based on the conditions that I'm passing and early stopping as I mentioned after 15 epochs if the thing is uh, not changing at all then I want to simply stop my training over there I don't want to use I don't want to train it for any kind of more epochs and then I'm just creating the callbacks list by using the checkpoint to save the best weights early stopping to stop early if, my, if there is no improvement in the loss and also I'm changing the learning rate based on this kind of parameters that i'm using and this is the minimum learning rate i will not let my model pass any learning rate less than that so i'll just run this and then now we are simply uh, just like you know writing our epochs that i want to train for the validation data is my valid x and valid y that we had created the callbacks that i'm using is this particular callback list and over here what I'm doing is I'm using segmented model that we had created over here in the model. We had created this segmented model, right? Where is it? Where is it? Over here. Yes, this is the segmented model. Now onto this, because I want to pass the augmented data and that's why we are using fit underscore generator. If we didn't want to have any kind of augmented data, then we could have just do model dot fit. But this fit generator is helping me know that i am passing in the augmented data and the steps per count and all these things we had already defined in the parameters but over here what i'm doing is i'm saying i want to take see i already explained like you know what is the step count we say what is the length of the training data and we just divide it with the batch size and now i'm just saying that out of this two i had considered this value as 200 out of this two whatever is the minimum value i am going to consider it as a step count and then i'm creating my augmented data with the help of the functions that i had created in this uh, whole project this make image generator is going to create uh, the train generator and then this augmented data onto it is going to give me the 
augmented training data and now based on these things i am simply going to create my loss history and run this is basically my training thing and i am not going to run any kind of training over here because i have not computed my loss it's your task to compute this loss and then train it for a particular epochs and then just get us some kind of results that you are getting and uh, i'll be telling you in detail like what are the tasks that you are going to solve but this is a very basic idea you are going to now just train it based on the loss that you will be computing over here and then i'm simply uh, like you know saving my weights as segmentation uh, underscore model dot h5 and now i will simply like you know load this models directly and see how my data is performing in the test images that i am having in my data so now that's it for this whole project i know that this particular project was pretty much long now what are the task for you to do first of all you are just going to compute first of all download this notebook and then compute the combo loss and then train your model and after training your model you are, you are going to save this particular model the best weights that you will be getting you will be just saving it and then you are after training the data with the things that i have given to you same as it is without any kind of changes you write down your conclusions and then based on your logical thinking change some of the things in this code and retrain this model and again try to write your observations based on it and then what we are going to do is once your model is more efficient after doing the changes we are going to apply that saved model after the changes has been done we are going to apply that saved model onto the test data that's it these are the tasks that you are going to do in this particular project so the main things that you should do in your submission notebook you should first of all implement the combo loss that is the dice plus bc and then conclusion and observations after retraining this model based on the changes that will be providing into the notebook and then implement this model the saved model that you have created you just implement that weights get into the test data and then mention your conclusions and what are the final outputs that you learned from this particular whole project and then in order to submit it you just create on this just click on this particular here it will redirect you to the form where we will submit this whole project and you will need two things over here that is this project id and the project name and this is again as i mention it it's a very much unique so don't make any kind of mistakes over here so simply fill this project id and the project name that is given over here and rest of the details you can just fill regarding like you know whatever you know what's your details just simply fill it up over here and uh, do subscribe our youtube channel and also register on our link if it's not already register on our website if you have not already done it that's the first step that's compulsory thing that you will have to register before submitting so make sure that you are signing up on this website of spartificial and then submitting your notebook and just by clicking on submit we will be receiving it and if your notebook is pretty much good if you have solved all the tasks that we have mentioned then you will be getting certificates as the part of the reward as i had mentioned in the earlier video so yeah for that's it for this particular video i know again this video was pretty much long but as the ship traffic is growing very fast with a powerful tool developed like this can strongly monitor maritime services and overall help in improve the efficiency at the sea it shall contribute to tasks like minimizing illegal fishing drug trafficking and environmental disasters that are caused due to ship accidents and not only this it can also track any illegal cargo movements that could be a threat when it comes to national security hence it can be heavily useful to many organizations from environmental protection agencies to national government authorities to have a closer watch over the seas even in the cloudy conditions with that being said i'll catch you soon again with some new and such interesting project